Today marks the 40th anniversary of the uh, dedication of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. All 58,000 names of service members who died or went missing are inscribed in black granite. Uh, it is the most visited memorial in Washington, D.C. How many of you have seen a picture of this memorial? Yeah, how many of you have been there? You've been to that more? Wow, many of you. Um, this past Friday was Veterans Day. Presently, there are 19 million veterans in the United States. 5% of those are World War II veterans. 31% uh, served in Vietnam, 41% the Gulf War, and 22% peacetime service. If you have served or are presently serving in the U.S. military, would you do us a favor and please stand up? If you have served, go ahead, stand up. If you are in the military or have been, yeah, look at them all. Let's give them a big hand. <clears throat> We're going to have a word of prayer. Let's pray right now. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for these who have served. We thank you for their service. There are others, of course, that are in our family and friends who have served as well. But we thank you for the blessing that you have um, given us in this country. And we do pray that this would be a country in God we trust. But we pray for our nation today. And we pray that as we continue on in the history of uh, this nation, that we would experience your blessing and your direction. And today on this Veterans Day, we especially thank you for the veterans who've made this country really possible. And we bless them today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, this November, uh, as we do every November here at Oak Hills Church, we're highlighting our local and global partners and the partners we have who share the good news of Jesus around the world. They share the good news of Jesus in our nation and they share the good news of Jesus just right here in the Twin Cities and the suburbs. This past Wednesday, the Johnsons were here and we met in the big room. It was so powerful. It was so good. I felt like they needed to sell tickets. It was so worthwhile. And um, I just, I got such a passion for what they do I wish you all could have been there. I know not all of you could be there, but that was really great. And then last Sunday, Brad Walls, a man who has traveled to 120 nations around the world, and he encourages other nations to spread the gospel, to create partners and missionaries uh, to share the gospel. It was so good. Now today, as I mentioned just a minute ago, Pastor Jen and I are going to have a conversation about why we here at Oak Hills Church are just so passionate about this idea of sharing the gospel around the world. But before she joins me up here, I just want to do a really quick review in, Clay, in case you weren't with us last week. Last week on Sunday, we presented um, our, um, our goal and our plan for the 2023 for the nations and the neighborhoods. And we passed out a brochure. I know some of you took it today and you have it in hand. Others of you were here last week and so you have that brochure. You also have the giving card but we're going to put it up here on the screen so you can see it. Um, and I want to just talk, to you, talk it through with you. This first page, you'll see that that little gold strip says that we've been involved in missions before we even started the church. And if you look at the diagram, look at the bottom left-hand corner. You can see how God has strategically placed us here on this corner to not only partner with folks bringing the gospel to the nations, but also so that we can bring the gospel to our own neighborhood right here. Um, and we're going to, uh, and that's really what Pastor Jen's going to talk about this morning. She's going to talk about the neighborhood. But let's talk about those 32 partners that we support around the world. If you look at page two now, what kind of ministry are they doing? Um, where, if you, for every hundred dollars that's given to missions here at Oak Hills Church, where does that money go? Where, how is it used? Well, Pastor uh, Jen, um, put together this handy dandy pie chart, which I think is so good, and it shows where we invest the money that you give, where we invest. You'll see it, we're we're investing in church planting. There's prayer emphasis, medical teams, disaster relief, university ministry, children and family education, nutrition, Bible colleges, and and so much more. And so you can be sure that every dollar you give to missions here at Oak Hills Church is very well used in making a difference in the world. Now, these first two pages really have to do with our support of our partners. The next two pages are really focused on something 
that we really feel is important for 2023. We felt the Lord calling us to put a special emphasis on our neighborhoods. So if we go to page three now, you can see it there. While we'll continue to support our partners around the world, definitely, and maybe even do more, we really felt it was time to complete our 1570 project. For those of you who don't know, i just quickly tell you that in 2017, we purchased the State Farm Building that you can see a kitty corner from our property. We've been planning to offer, ever since that time, we've been planning to offer a community center with a community coffee shop, community businesses upstairs, and then ministry to the community in the space downstairs and the beautiful outdoor space. And you can see that we did a survey with 2,000 neighbors, 331 responded, 71% of them said, we have a need in this neighborhood for a cafe or coffee shop, for community space and meeting space. Then at the bottom, you can see a general idea of the remodeling plan. I know that's pretty small, but um, that gives you a general idea. The upper level will be community-minded businesses, and the lower level will be a space where we can bless our neighborhood and do community ministry. And then if we go to that last page, the path forward. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Uh, that's from the, uh, the Apostle John talked about when Jesus came and moved into the neighborhood, came to our world. So here's what we want to do in 2023. First, as I mentioned, we want to keep supporting all of our 32 partners. We want to keep doing that. Second, as <clears throat> soon as possible in the new year, which is just a few weeks away, um, we want to start remodeling the 1570 building, and then as soon as we can begin the ministry we've been dreaming about for five years to our neighborhood. If you look at that big arrow at the bottom, in 2017, we purchased the building. We paid it off two years later. Since then, we've raised another $300,000. It's amazing. And to remodel the building to use as a community center, we need another $880,000, which seems like it wouldn't be possible, but you know what? It is possible because we have some amazing faith-filled people here at Oak Hills Church. And throughout the month of October, we're into November now, but throughout the month of October, uh, there were a number of our folks who built a matching fund for this 1570 project so that our gifts, some of you were a part of that matching fund, but most of us were not, and so that our gifts can be matched and doubled and have a double impact. That means that anything that you and I decide to give toward 1570, okay, and Melody and I haven't done that yet. We're praying about it. We've talked about it a number of times what we should give, but anything we give will be matched up to, this is what was amazing, uh, $360,000 has already been committed in October to this project. So if we match that, we'd have $720,000 by the end of next year. And just as we're finishing construction, if all goes well, um, we would have 720000 of this 880, and who knows, we could have it all. I just think that is so amazing. And so I want to challenge you today, uh, this month, to one, um, pray about giving to our missions fund next year so we can support our missionaries. And I'm going to ask Pastor Jen to come right now, and she's going to join me. As she's coming, let me just show you this last slide. Um, some of you received this today, um, and um, some of you got it last week, but this card right here, you'll see, it's really important, this giving card, because it's, it has two parts. The top half has to do with our missions budget, Okay. And so that's the support. We, we, we support missionaries at about $7,000 a month. And so that's the money that we support our missionaries with. And so if you'd like to give, and if you, if you haven't pledged before and you do today, that will be matched up to $10,000. Somebody has given $10,000. So new people, it'll be matched. So if you gave $10, it'll be $20. If you give $50, it'll be $100. And, or if you have a pledge and you increase it, that pledge will be matched as well up to $10,000. And so I want to ask you to pray about that and do it by the end of this month. That would be what I wish you would do. And I know there's some of you out there, you're going to give to missions, but you're not going to fill out that card. You're just going to get me, aren't you? You're going to go, I'll show you, Pastor Rod. I'm going to give to missions, but I'm not going to fill out that card. I know you're not, but I hope the Lord does something to you. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, I would appreciate it if you do so we know how we can support. And the bottom half of this card, 
then is for the 1570 project. Last week, as I mentioned, I mentioned this 360. And just in some cards that came in, we, we, added an, we matched that with $16,000 more pledged. And you can give this until the end of next year. Whatever you pledge, you can give to the end of next year. And so I want to ask you to really pray about that. And you can give in a card. You can just drop it in the black uh, boxes out there. Or you can go online and you can make a pledge that way. So, <clears throat> Pastor Jen, welcome. Hi, thank you. Nice to have you up here. Um, so, Pastor Jen leads our, uh, you've been on our church staff, I think, 16, 17 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Was this the best job you've ever had in your yes. life? That's what I yes. thought. Um, <laughs> she, uh, she directs our discipleship ministry, our counseling ministry, and also our missions ministry, which is why whenever it comes to missions, Jen, Pastor Jen is always involved. We're going to talk for a few minutes about the nations and the neighborhood and today. And so I'm going to kind of focus on the nations, and then she's going to talk about our neighborhood. So let's, let's take a look. As we talk today, our heart is that, one, you'll see why we're so passionate about this. But two, we're praying that you will get a better picture of the need in our neighborhood and around the world and why God is so passionate about bringing the gospel to everybody. That's our heart. So let's start with the nations. The UN recognizes that there are 195 nations in the world. So it's probably really good for all of us who are Americans to remember that we are only one of 195 nations. Now, America is not perfect. It's not a perfect country, but it's a good one, and we're privileged and we're blessed to live here. That said, we are just one of 195 nations. And I think sometimes we get a little bit on us. So it's really important, I think, to know this. What about religions in the world? We're talking about the world right now and the nations of the world. You know that Christianity is the largest religion in the world at 30%. Islam is second, 23%. Hinduism, 15%. Non-religious, 13%. Ethnic religions, 9%. Buddhism is almost 7%. And then other religions at 1.4%. Now, nations with the highest percentage of Christians. You know what nation has the highest percentage of Christians at 100%? The Vatican, okay? Since that was, I think there are a few Philistines in there, but um, uh, I, think, I think that, so, and then the nation with the lowest percentage of Christians, you ready for this? Somalia. At 0.01%. They have less than 1,000 Christians in Somalia. The United States of America, where you and I, where most of us live, 71% of America is Christian, which is an awful lot. But get this. It's just under Ghana and tied with Spain at 92nd place. In other words, there are 91 countries in the world who have more Christians percentage-wise than the United States of America. So we're right kind of in the middle, and we're tied, we're tied with Spain. But the U.S. does have the most Christians. If you go percentage-wise, we're in the middle. But we also have the most Christians in the world, 230 million Christians in this country. And, uh, of course, this is Catholics, Protestants, and, and, and the, whole, the whole group. But here's the thing. We're followed by Brazil, Mexico, and Russia, but we by far have the most Christians. But the U.S., here's the thing. The U.S. is becoming secularized. The United States has seen a dramatic rise in its non-religious, that is, atheist and agnostic population, from just 1.32% of the population, okay, agnostics, atheists, were just 1.3 in 1900. Today, it's up to 15%. Over the same period, Christians have dropped from 96% of America to, as I mentioned earlier, 71%. However, in terms of raw numbers, Christians are still the vast majority, 230 million. So since we still have so many Christians, a lot of people say, well, what, what, they wonder, why are people calling the U.S. a post-Christian nation? And maybe you've heard me use this term, and I have used it in sermons. I talk about how uh, America has become post-Christian, and maybe you've wondered what that means. Listen, a post-Christian society is where... Christianity is no longer the dominant civil religion, but has gradually assumed values, culture, and worldviews that are not necessarily Christian. So that's why we call it post-Christian, because we do live in a country now where the civil religion, 
where the morals, the attitudes, the truths that Christian, Christians believe from the Bible really has waned in this country. And I do think that describes the U.S., that we are for sure post-Christians. Now, here's the thing. I think Christians have two views on why this has happened. See what you think. This is my own opinion. But I think Christians have two views on why we have become post-Christian. And maybe you have one or the other. Maybe you've never thought about this. But here's, here's what I think. One view, why we have become secularized, is because we Christians haven't legislated Christianity well enough. The non-religious have legislated Christianity better than us. Now, that's one view. Here's the other view. We Christians haven't lived Christianity well enough, and the non-religious didn't see anything better in us. Now, those are two views, but here's the thing. No matter what your view might be, I think all Christians, no matter their view, want people to at least hear the gospel. They want them to hear the good news and the message of Jesus. And so our theme this year is nations and neighborhoods. So I've spent a few minutes on the nations of the world, and now uh, Pastor Jen's going to focus on our neighborhood. Um, most of it right here, but also she's, what I want you to think about and what she wants us all to think about is the neighborhoods where we live. So Jen, mm -hmm. talk a little bit about joining God. Yeah. Um, so that's really good. Thank you, Pastor Rod. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> as we begin, I, I think it's important to kind of set the framework for how we're thinking about this. And um, we're coming to this conversation with um, a, an assumption. Our assumption is that God is already at work in the world. Mm -hmm. And from the, we see this from the very beginning of the Bible. We sang about this today um, as, as we are worshiping together. God has been the primary actor throughout all of history, including today. <clears throat> and sometimes when we think about missions, um, sometimes we, we think about it um, maybe by accident as if we are bringing God somewhere where God hasn't been. But it's important for us to remember that God is already present. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Mm. And um, as Pastor Rod mentioned in a sermon <clears throat> about place a couple of weeks ago, we know that God has strategically placed us right here on this corner in Egan. And as we're thinking about that, there's a few things we can keep in mind. First of all, God has always been present in this neighborhood. He formed this ground. He created each one of our neighbors and has been active in their lives. Um, he's been active in the lives of every person who's ever lived here. Um, God knows the details of every story, of every person who drives by, God knows. God knows what happens behind closed doors, and he deeply, deeply cares. God is good and loving beyond our wildest imaginations, and he has, a, he has good news of love and hope and a plan for the future for every person in our neighborhood. And that message isn't just for us. It's a message of hope that extends to the nations as well. So uh, what I want to encourage us to do is to pay close attention so that we can begin to recognize what God is up to and the ways that he is calling us to join what he's doing in the world. So Pastor Jen, a couple, a couple of uh, months ago or weeks ago, you led a little devotional when our staff was here praying on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And that thing you said right there was something that caught my attention. You said God's already at work. It's not like we're bringing God to this place. It's not like God wasn't already there. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so good, but I think people might think, well, then if God's already there, then why do we go, mm -hmm. you know? And what I want you to hear is be, what we want is for people to at least hear. Mm -hmm. So if God's already working here, sometimes people don't know it's God. They don't know the message. And so when they drive by a church, at least they could say, okay, there's something there. And if we can minister to those areas and let them hear about Jesus... That's really what we're after. So let's talk about the name of Jesus. Let's talk, about for, let's talk about why. Why do we do this? Okay, if God's already there, why do we do this? Well, the Great Commission, first of all, Jesus said, uh, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So some people, as I mentioned, rightly ask, isn't it 
Um, isn't it sort of, and maybe you've thought this, isn't it sort of arrogant for Christians to go into these places and bring the gospel message of Jesus and make people follow their religion? Isn't that sort of arrogant and whatever else word you might come up with? And the answer that I would say to you about that is yes. It is. I really believe it is. It's arrogant to go in and to force and manipulate the gospel on people. Jesus didn't even do that, so I don't think he's asking us to do that. But the goal is, at least as I mentioned, to let the nations hear the good news. Not force them to accept it, but give them the opportunity to hear it and accept it if they choose. And this is what the Apostle Paul said. He was a great missionary. In Romans 15, 20, he said, My ambition has always been to preach the good news where the name of Christ has never been heard. So, get this. You wonder why do we at Oak Hills Church have this missions emphasis in November and throughout the year? Get this, you guys. Um, despite Christ's command to go into all the world, the Great Commission I just read, 67% of all humans from AD 30 to the present day have never even heard the name of Jesus. 60%, 67%. In the last 40 years, over 1 billion people have died who have never heard of Jesus, and around 30 million people this year will perish without hearing the message of salvation. 86% of all unreached people groups lie, and we have a lot of partners serving in this area of the world, but 86% of all unreached people in the world right now lie within a region called the 1040 window. You may have heard of this, which is between 10 and 40 degrees north and from the west coast of Africa to the east coast of Asia. Uh, and here's the challenge. 60% of unreached people groups live in countries that are closed to partners, to missionaries. 60% of all unreached groups are in nations that are closed to the Christian message. They don't have the opportunity to hear the name of Jesus. And, and 818 unreached people groups have never been targeted by any Christian agency ever. So let's consider that's the need. Let me just, I'm going to go to part two of this talk. Let's consider um, the Christian church and its investment into the Great Commission. So we are the Christian church. All of us here today, this is Oak Hills Church. We're the Christian church. 40% uh, of the church's entire global foreign mission resources are being deployed in just 10 oversaturated countries. So right now, churches that are investing in going around the world, 40% um, of that is going into just 10 oversaturated countries where they've heard the gospel again and again and again. Christians right now make up 33% of the world's population, but receive 53% of the world's annual income, but they spend 98% of their income on themselves. 98%. So really, the biggest problem in missions today is that the majority of the Western church's resources are being spent on evangelizing places that have already been evangelized, while almost no resources are going to the least reached places. In fact, only 1% of all Christian giving is going toward evangelizing unreached people groups around the world. So you might wonder then, well, Pastor Rod, you know, it's interesting you say that because we're about to, you just told us, you want to invest in this uh, 1570 project across the street. Well, here's what we need to know. Those numbers that I just told you about the Christian church kind of investing in itself, those numbers indicate a Christian church investing in itself apply really more to new church buildings, Christian schools, and ministries that are directed to Christians. Now, there's nothing wrong with those things, but that's where we spend most of our money or the resources that we have. We spend it on ourselves, and we spend it on more Christians. And God is calling us to spend those resources on reaching out to others. So this... Um, the group we're wanting to reach, yes, they're in our own country, but we're not really spending it on ourselves. We're spending it on our neighborhood. We're spending it on the unreached that live right around us. So Jen's going to talk about our neighborhood right now mm -hmm. and just talk about this neighborhood, but relate it to yours too, because I think you'll find it interesting, the neighborhood where this church is. Mm -hmm. I think one of the challenges that happens um, when it comes to giving or serving 
uh, is, is that we don't often have a relationship with people, and so sometimes it's difficult for us to give yeah. um, when we can't see or picture, like, who are these people? You know, yeah. who are these people that God loves so much? So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the demographics of our neighborhood. <clears throat> and as pa- Pastor Rod mentioned before, this is one of the most ethnically diverse um, neighborhoods in Egan. And uh, the Three of the top languages spoken in homes are English, Spanish, and Somali, within a two-mile radius. Um, There's also many other cultures um, and languages that are also represented here in this neighborhood. This area is economically diverse as well. And something that's really interesting, there's about approximately 40% of the housing units within two miles of Oak Hills Church are um, renter-occupied. And so this is one of the biggest changes that has happened in this area since 2015. Um, It's this number of townhomes and apartments has increased so much. We had no idea when we first were here that there would be so many apartment buildings right in this new development even um, next to Hy-Vee in that area. Mm -hmm. This is really significant because this indicates a high mobility rate um, of people moving in and out of the area, and it increases Uh, their need for connection and for connecting with people really quickly. This means that um, we might not have a lot of time to connect with our neighbors. So um, I don't know about you, but sometimes I think like, oh, get around to it, (laughs) right? But these are the moments that we have with our neighbors. So we need to make each moment count. Um, The number of young adults in this neighborhood has also increased by 29%. And the adults ages 65 to 74 has also increased over 33% since 2015. Um, When you look around, it looks like there are so many churches that can help people connect or receive the help that they need or to hear the good news that Jesus loves them. And there's this relationship with God that's available to them. Um, But while there are a lot of places of worship available to residents in Dakota County, at least 39% of people have no affiliation with a faith community. And it's very likely that this number has also increased since 2020. Yeah, so let's call it 40%. Sure. And, and 40% of the people in this area right here have no connection with a faith community. And I want to talk about that, uh, and I want to talk about why that is, and at least some of the reasons why that is. But something you mentioned a lot of those mobile people in and out mm-hmm. are young adults. Mm-hmm. And so if we dream about 1570, we're going to have a coffee shop there, and we're going to have ministry there, we're going to have like concert nights, and we're going to have story nights. Mm-hmm. I could see us reaching some of those people that are just here mm-hmm. a year or two or three and hearing the gospel, getting connected to a Christian, and, and opening their hearts to Jesus. Now, the problem is what I'm going to tell you right now. Some of these stats you might know about, but let's talk about our nation and why, why it is that around here and really around the country, so few people are connected to a Christian faith community. Why aren't more people connected? Um, why, why has America become so secularized and post-Christian? Well, as I mentioned earlier, some Christians feel um, we haven't legislated Christianity well enough and Christian values well enough. What I believe, this is a personal view of mine, is that we Christian have, Christians haven't lived our Christian values well enough. Here are a few recent stats that support my idea, okay? And the first one is only 21% of non-Christian people, get this, 21% of non-Christian people have a positive perception of the local church. 21% of non-Christian people have a positive view of the church. Can you imagine? They don't even think of church in a positive way. They don't even think church is necessary in the culture. One of the sharpest differences in the research is this. 80% of people who go to church, they like their church. They have a positive view of church, but only 21% of non-Christians think of church in a positive way. Now, on the positive front, generally speaking, those who attend church regularly really do appreciate what the church does for both them and others. I know that's how most of you feel because you tell us that all the time with kind words and you feel that way about the church, you tell us that. But the challenge is this, folks. Though, here's the thing, that one in five non-Christians see it this way, which creates this enormous barrier when we're trying to connect with unchurched people. 
So the church does not have a good reputation in America today. Here's the second thing that we need to know about, and that is half of non-Christian Americans don't trust <laughs> local pastors. Uh, that's on me and us pastors. But half of non-Christian Americans don't trust local pastors. 85% of Christians trust Christian pastors in their community, but less than half of non-Christians feel the same way. And so this is why if we're, if we're in Christianity, if we're in a church, we can feel like, oh, the church is great. I love our pastor. I know you love Pastor Jen and me very, very much. We can feel it. We feel the love coming from you. But here, here's the thing. So we can feel like, I think church is a good thing. I don't know why they don't want to come. That's not how they feel. And we need to deal with this. We need to think about this. Similarly, there's a 30-point gap between how Christians and non-Christians see local pastors providing, get this, strong leadership on racial justice and COVID. And whatever you might think about what happened at COVID, there were certain decisions that some churches made that caused non-Christians to just go, see, they don't care. They don't care about the community. They don't care. And that's, we can agree or disagree with that decision they made, but that's what happened. So being able to trust church leaders in general and on issues like crisis leadership and racial justice matters because trust at its heart is about confidence. Without trust, everything breaks down, folks. Let me give you one more on this, and that is generations. Millennials think the local church is detached from the real issues people are facing. And so we're going to just do a little survey here, and we're going to find out so Gen Z were born 1997 to 2012, and right now that, a, that group is 10 to 25 years old. Any Gen Zers here today? Okay, we got a number of you, Gen Zers. Okay, ha, uh, millennials, which is the group we're talking about, uh, they were born 1981 to 1996. Right now you're 26 to 41. Any millennials here today? Raise your hand. Okay, a bunch of you. God bless you. Gen X, uh, 42 to 57 years old today. You were born 65 to 80. How many Gen Xers here today? Okay. And then Boomers, too. There's like two groups of Boomers. Boomers, too. They were born 1955 to 1964. You're between the ages of 58 and 67. Raise your hand if you're a Boomer. Okay. Now, I'm not going to go any further because the rest of you don't want to show your age, but, <laughs> we, but we saw that you didn't raise your hand. Okay. And so <clears throat> here's another thing that, that surfaced in research. In several areas, church-going millennials had a more negative view of the church. They're church-going millennials. They have a more negative view of the church than the older generations. Here's why. Millennials were slightly more likely, well, here, here's another fact, to think of the church leaders as hypocritical and judgmental. They are twice as likely as boomers to think that their church was detached from the real issues facing their community. In a similar way, millennials were more likely to say that Christian pastors are out of touch with the needs of their community and that pastors seem more focused on growing their church and not on community transformation. And that um, that's, shows us this growing generational gap about social is issues and the expectation of younger generations to see their church addressing the broader social issues of the day. I want to read you something Carrie Newhoff said. And it's just a quote. Listen to what he said. The challenge here for church leaders and Christians, church attenders, is that it's difficult to reach a community that the next generation don't believe we care about. Naturally, if you do care, this is Kerry Newhoff, about your community, as many church leaders do, it's probably important to have some evidence that that's the case beyond virtue signal signaling and token gestures. A deep investment in the health and well-being of the people who live in the community you're trying to reach is not only the right thing, it's a step toward ushering them into the hope and love of the gospel. That's the end of that quote. So I'm going to give it back to Jen, but just a minute. We need and we must invest more in bringing the good news to the unreached nations of the world. But folks, we must reach our own nation and invest in our own nation in a new way, not just in new buildings, not just in new worship centers, but in projects that speak to the real needs of the community and neighborhoods where we all live. And that's one of the reasons we're, 
we're believing in 1570. It's just one thing, but it's one thing God's called us to. So Jen, um, what I said about our community plays out in what you have found, and we're, you're going to personalize this, and then we're going to close. But um, you, you've, you know a little more personal stories and some mm-hmm. stuff. Tell us about that. Yeah. <clears throat> so a few months ago, I had the privilege of um, speaking with, interviewing some community leaders, and I asked them to share um, what they found to be both the strengths of Egan and the opportunities that we have in this community. <clears throat> and so here are just some of the themes that came up. First, uh, everyone mentioned first uh, that Egan's economy is one of the greatest strengths because of the city's diverse um, commercial base. Egan was in a really good financial position coming out of the pandemic. Um, Next, they mentioned the availability of parks as a core strength. Um, Most residents live within one mile of a park. There's over 60 or around 60 in Egan. Um, or they live really close to green space and nature trails, and this is really significant because it's important to community health. <clears throat> and this played a crucial role in the overall well- well-being um, throughout the pandemic. How many of you like to get outside and you like to take a hike? Yes, perfect. Um, and so uh, two of the community leaders that I talked to, they offered helpful in- insights regarding the needs that they're also seeing in the community. So one person said, that many families have been coming to them for help because parents are underemployed. And so they're not making enough money to get ahead, but their income is still too high to receive some of the county assistance and support that would be helpful for them. And so they mentioned a need for affordable housing and affordable childcare. The need for mental health support for Mm -hmm. all ages is also another core need in our neighborhood. Um, One leader mentioned that they've seen a startling number of people who, um, an increased number of domestic violence uh, victims uh, who have been coming to them. And so we're noticing Egan is overall very wealthy and healthy. We have great schools, uh, wonderful programs, services that are available to residents. But while uh, many are doing well financially, it's also really important to remember many of our neighbors are still really struggling. Uh, Another theme that came up is a need for spaces, and this came up on our survey that we uh, showed, um, and it's part of your brochure, Uh, but it's a space for people to gather and experience authentic connection. One leader noted that more than any other group, teens have really lost a number of safe spaces to hang out in Egan. So coffee shops are closing a little bit earlier, um, and there are other spaces that are already claimed for sports or other activities. So teenagers are having um, fewer places to meet besides like being outside, which winter is coming. So <laughs> I'm so grateful for the community leaders that I got to speak to because, um, and for their willingness to share their thoughts with me. Because I think one of the first and best things we can do to love our neighbors well is to listen. Um, Over the past few months, as I have listened, and I know many of you probably have too, I've also noticed the way people are reaching out to connect. Mm -hmm. Um, In one Facebook group, it has over 12,000 members. There was um, an individual who reached out to the group and just asked, if anyone would be interested in having a new friend. Um, They shared about their stage in life. They were very honest that they were having a difficult time connecting with other people uh, in the community. And it was very interesting because their post received over 100 comments. Mm. And um, many of them were really encouraging. So some people said, oh, let's get together. You know, it was an offer to get together. There were a number of other people who said, I understand. I'm right there with you. I'm in that same stage. Um, But what I thought was very interesting is there were a number of people who said, you're so brave to post this. I feel the same way. And just getting a cup of coffee or having a new friend would be actually really great. So I think um, for people of all ages, there is this epidemic of loneliness in America. We hear about this on the news. We hear about it everywhere. Um, And it's not new. Even Mother Teresa uh, talked about this. She said, the greatest disease in the West today is not tuberculosis or leprosy. It is being unwanted, unloved, and uncared for. Mm. We can cure physical diseases with medicine, 
But the only cure for loneliness, despair, and hopelessness is love. The poverty in the West is a different kind of poverty. It is not only a poverty of loneliness, but also of spirituality. There is a hunger for love as there is a hunger for God. In addition to the physical and practical needs we all have, one of the primary needs we have is for authentic connection and friendship with both God and other people. So every week we say, wherever you are on your faith journey, you can start here. Mm -hmm. Um, And we mean it, and that is one of the most uh, important things that that we can share. And I'm wondering, what if perhaps God is inviting us, you and I, to have that mindset wherever we go, that it isn't just about coming into Oak Hills Church, but what if we took that mindset with us to our neighborhoods, to our stores, to our workplaces, where we meet people and we intend fully to meet them right where they are, Mm -hmm. spiritually, emotionally, physically, wherever they are in their faith journey, and that we meet people uh, right where they are and participate in God's creative, redemptive, and reconciling work in the world. In the Gospels, Jesus invited all kinds of people to Mm -hmm. come to him. And he also actively moved into the neighborhood. He also actively went to people, like the Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4. Or in Luke chapter 19, Uh, Jesus reached out to a tax collector named Zacchaeus, who nobody liked. (laughs) And he said, Zacchaeus, I'm coming over to your house today. He met them right where they were at, and in each encounter, their lives were changed because Jesus showed them what the grace, the goodness, the love, the mercy of God is like. Joining God's work in the world um, will always tend toward concrete expressions of love for real people who are in need around us. And as a church, we are already loving our neighbors and we're already loving the nations in concrete ways by praying, by giving, and by serving. And God is also opening up more opportunities for us to do that. And I think the key is that we pay attention to that and that we're willing to join whatever God is asking us to do. That's really good, Jen. Mm -hmm. We're going to We're going to close in prayer here, and I'm going to ask Jen to pray for the neighborhood and for your neighborhood where you live. I'm going to pray for the nation. She's going to begin here. Before we pray, I just want to say that hopefully this conversation has helped you uh, to see why we here at Oak Hills are so passionate about our neighborhood, about, about the nations, and about loving those areas and those people, those people. And, um, you know, My prayer is that you'll be inspired, first of all, to love, to love in your neighborhood, and also to invest time, and also to uh, think about your church and what God's doing in your church body to reach out to our neighborhood and the nations. So, Jen, why don't we um, pray together, and you begin, and then I'll I'll close. Let's all pray together, okay? God, you are so good. We began this morning by remembering how good you are, by how you have been active throughout history, how you've been active in our lives every day. God, I thank you for your goodness, for your presence here in this place and in our everyday lives. And Lord, there are so many people who do not know how good you are. They do not know the name of Jesus. They do not know the hope that you offer and how deeply you love them. And Lord Jesus, I pray that your heart for the nations and the neighborhoods in which we live, Lord, I pray that that your heart would get into our hearts, that our hearts would sync up with yours. God, I pray that we wouldn't be able to walk by and ignore people, but that we would have concrete expressions of love for real people who need you. Lord Jesus, I pray for an anointing on this property, on this place. Um, We thank you for the way that you're already moving. God, I thank you for the teams who are serving at a local elementary school and in so many ways throughout the Twin Cities. Lord, I thank you for every person who's here for every attender of Oak Hills Church, and I pray, God, for a special anointing on their lives, that everywhere we go, it would be 
it would be you moving out, uh, moving toward people. Help us to move toward people the way that you do. Help us to see them, to love them, and to meet them where they are, and to say, um, just to show an expression of your love for them. Lord, help us to walk with them toward you. God, I thank you for everything you're doing in this neighborhood, and I, I pray for our 1570 project. God, you know the plans you have for that space. For every person who drives by, you know their story. Lord God, I pray that this, there would be something so special about this corner, and that we would be able to hear story after story of the way that you are meeting people and the way you are changing lives. We thank you for what you're doing and for your goodness. Mm. As your heads are bowed, just think about who told you about Jesus? It was probably a parent or it was a, uh, maybe a small group, maybe it was college ministry, maybe it was just somebody on the street, but somebody along the way shared with you the name of Jesus. And there are so many that haven't heard. And our heart is that we want people to know your goodness, Lord. And so we go across the nations, 195 nations of the world, some of them are closed to people coming in and sharing the name of Jesus. But we pray for those countries to open up. We pray for our partners around the world that you would bless them and anoint them. You'd use them in a powerful way. And we pray that the Great Commission would be fulfilled. The name of Jesus would be brought to every person in every nation of the world. And every person would have the opportunity to hear the good news about Jesus. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Jen. Thank you. Well, time to go, but I have some very important things to say to you. Uh, first of all, prayer. Ben and Jane are right over here. We'd love to pray with you today. In fact, I believe there are some of you here today. We've been talking about Jesus and the name of Jesus, sharing Jesus with people. And... Um, you realize that you've never invited Jesus into your heart. And so today is that day for you. So I want to encourage you to open your heart to Jesus. And in doing that, come on down and pray with uh, Ben and Jane or any other need you have. If you uh, have somebody you're burdened for, if you right now need prayer, please don't, don't leave right away. Come down and let him pray for you. And if you're not able to do that, I just encourage you to go to our website. You hit connect and prayer and care, and we'll pray for you this week. Um, and then I want to talk to you. There are three things really quick I want to tell you. One, next Sunday, Nick Puccini is going to conclude our mission's emphasis. He's going to talk about how each of us can surprise the world by the way we share the gospel. And this, the great thing about us sharing our own story is that it's our story. We get to go as we are. We get to just be who we are. And uh, Nick is a great preacher. And you're going to love his message next week. And he's going to conclude our mission's uh, emphasis this year. So I hope you'll join us. And then as we leave today, we're going to take a very special offering for the MKs. How many of you know what an MK is? Okay. An MK is a missionary kid. And just up the street here, we have three missionary kids living. And uh, missionary kids, they give a lot. They live in different parts of the world, sometimes very tough parts of the world. They give up sometimes friendships and uh, all kinds of things that they often willingly do because they love their parents and they love, but it's very tough. And we like to bless missionary kids who live in our house. So what we do every year is we take an offering for the missionary kids. And what we do with this is if you have change in your pocket today, ushers are going to be at the door. I know some of you don't carry cash, so don't feel bad. But some of you have cash. In fact, you have a lot of cash. And I want, I want all of it, OK? I want all of it. But if you have change, if you have a dollar, if you have $10, if you have a $100 bill, uh, our ushers are going to be at the door. They're going to be holding. If you have something, we're going to take an offering for our missionary kids. Three beautiful kids live right up here. And we're going to give them a check. Christmas is coming. And we're going to give them a great Christmas gift. So, Please give in that offering today. It's going to be a blessing. The final thing I want to tell you is that in two weeks, Advent begins. And this year, our theme for Christmas is the promised one. And as you leave today at the welcome table, you'll see there's a whole stack of these devotionals. And we would love for you and your family to, to do this devotional 
with your spouse or with your kids uh, through the uh, Advent season. And so these are free, but we'd like you to take one per family. But we're trying to get every family in Oak Hills Church to walk through this. It's just, it's about five minutes a day through Advent. You read it, you do it as a devotional. You can grab one as you leave, but it begins in two weeks on the 27th. And we're going to have a great time during Advent season this year. Um, there's hot coffee available in the big room. I hope you can stay a few more minutes and hang around and connect. God bless you. We'll see you.